The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the Clean Energy Solutions Center and welcome to today's webinar which is jointly hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center and the UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network in collaboration with SunFounder. Today's webinar is focused on the next steps in scaling finance for energy access, syndicating deals between multiple lenders. And before we begin, I just want to go over some of the webinar features. You do have a couple options for audio. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. That will help eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option. And a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. If anyone's having any technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826. And if you'd like to ask a question, which we encourage you to do at any point during the webinar, simply type your question into the question pane and we'll receive those. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you'll be able to download PDF copies of the presentations through cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. Uh, also, we'll be posting an audio recording of the presentations to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast, and we will also be adding it to the Solution Center YouTube channel, where you will find other informative webinars, as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. And finally, one important note of mention is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices, resources, reviewed and selected by technical experts. And today's agenda, webinar agenda, is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Jem Pecoro, Willem Nolans, and David Batley, who have joined us to discuss the role of syndicated lending for scaling finance for energy access. Before we go into the presentations, I'll just provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, and then following the presentations, we'll have the question and answer session where the panelists will address the questions submitted by the audience. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, you'll uh, receive a prompt to fill out a very brief survey, and we thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond to that. And I'd like to give an overview of the Clean Energy Ministerial and Clean Energy Solutions Center now. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology to share lessons learned and best practices and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. There's currently 24 countries along with the European Commission that are members covering about 90% of clean energy investment and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this webinar today is being provided by the Clean Energy Solution Center, which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies related to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. And the Clean Energy Solution Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States with in-kind support from the government of Mexico. And the Solution Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, and an online library containing over 5,000 clean energy policy related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. The primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. We also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And finally, the Solution Center is an international initiative initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across its suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include research organizations like IRENA and the IEA, programs like SE for All, and regionally focused entities such as the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. 
And I just want to highlight one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides, which is the no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with one of the more than 50 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. So, for example, in the area of energy access, we're very pleased to have Lyndon Frierson, Managing Director of CAP Projects, serving as one of our experts. So if you, if you had a need for policy assistance in finance for energy access or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, the assistance is provided to you free of charge. So if you have a question for our experts, please simply submit it through our online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. And we also invite and encourage you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So now I'd like to provide some introductions for today's panelists. Uh, first up today is Jem Pecoro, a Senior Director of Energy Access at the UN Foundation. Jem provides leadership, management, and project support to the Foundation's energy access work with a particular focus on its involvement in the UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative. And then following Jem, we'll hear from Willem Nolens. Willem has been a social entrepreneur for almost 20 years with a focus on microfinance and renewable energy in Africa. He transformed the award-winning Rural Energy Foundation into Solar Now and has been the CEO since inception. And our final speaker is David Batley, who spent almost a decade working in corporate debt origination in London and a further five years working with both the charity Solar Aid and Sunny Money as part of the senior management team. David joined the Sun Funder team in August 2015. And so with those introductions, I'd like to turn things over to Jim Pecoro. Thanks, Sean. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. And see, uh, see your slides. Perfect. Great. Fantastic. Thanks again for that introduction. Uh, and again, my name is Jem Porcar. I'm the Senior Director of Energy Access. I lead uh, the UN Foundation's Energy Access Program here based in Washington, D.C. Uh, thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, again, um, appreciate the partnership with Clean Energy Solutions Center in delivering these webinars. And thanks to our uh, both Willem and David for uh, agreeing to participate in what uh, we believe is going to be a pretty interesting um, and discussion around the role of syndicated uh, loans in, in financing energy access. Um, I'm going to make it really brief because uh, I think uh, David and Willem are really the stars of this conversation. Um, so before I kind of hand it over to them, just a quick overview of the Energy Access Practitioner Network for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, this is a network of roughly now 2,500 practitioners um, working around the world, um, namely in delivering distributed energy solutions to the underserved communities um, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and elsewhere. We're technology agnostic, uh, but again, with a particular focus on market-led distributed energy solutions. Um, these 2,500 um, individuals represent roughly 1,400 plus organizations, uh, a, a pretty kind of wide um, and representative group, um, kind of representing the ecosystem at large, everybody from uh, SMEs, entrepreneurs, up to investors, um, governments. Um, the network really is a platform for connecting these practitioners with ideas, information, resources, tools, opportunities, really a platform for collaboration and, um, and kind of partnership building. And so it's kind of under the auspices of the Energy Access Practitioner Network and our partnership with the Clean Energy Solutions Center that we're delivering this, this webinar to you. Um, as you know, as mentioned, um, this this webinar is going to focus on uh, the role of syndicated lending for financing energy access. This is the first, actually, uh, in a the first webinar in a new series uh, that the UN Foundation is is putting out there. A webinar series focused on financing. So there will be more to come in the months to come. Um, and, and this financing webinar series will really look at kind of broadly the, the opportunities and challenges for financing energy access um, more broadly. Uh, a little bit of information about following us on social media. Um, just wanted to kind of tee up the conversation with just one background slide. 
Um, I think, you know, it, it uh, don't probably doesn't, I don't really need to say this, but I think most on this line will recognize that obviously financing continues to be a big bottleneck for, for growth in the distributed energy sector. Um, I think this webinar is really timely. We just put out uh, the results of our Energy Access Practitioner Network survey just a uh, few weeks ago at the Sustainable Energy for All Forum. These are a, a couple of clips of some findings related to finance. Access to finance uh, ranked as kind of the, the number one barrier to growth for distributed energy, renewable energy by both industry and investors. And then if you begin to drill down, you begin to see you start seeing some trends that I think are really relevant to this indication, uh, this issue of syndication. Um, the, the bottom left um, figure shows industry and investor views on the barriers to financing, and among the top three are things like lack of support from local banks and local currency, and insufficient knowledge of investors, and no innovative deal or fund structures. I think these are uh, some interesting findings that are relevant to today's discussion. And then on the bottom right, we see some industry views on challenges to raising financing. And among some of the top ones, we see time required to raise funds, high interest rates, and a lack of local lenders and investors. Again, some um, interesting context and background for what should be uh, an informative discussion, I think, between David, uh, Willem, and ourselves around the role of syndication in financing energy access. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Willem now. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, Willem Nolens. Um, I'm sharing really uh, the practitioner perspective on loan syndication. And uh, as some of you know, uh, last year we started an SPV structure with um, with SunFunder called SAFI, the Structured Asset Finance Instrument. And uh, the, the objective of that structure was to finance our receivable book. Sora now is, uh, is uh, a Sora company in Uganda. We recently started in Kenya. Uh, we deal in uh, slightly, slightly larger solar home systems and um, productive energy systems. Currently, our revenue is around six hundred thousand dollars per month. Uh, all our, or almost all of our systems are sold with a twenty-four month uh, pay plan. Um, and um, yeah, of course, we need a lot of uh, money for uh, refinancing the, uh, the portfolio of receivables. The first uh, decision we took actually back in twenty fourteen was to maximize the, the debt funding of that portfolio. I mean, it's one of the items on your balance sheet that have a fixed term. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's a perfect asset to be financed with loans rather than, than with equity. Hi, Will. I'm sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, we can't yeah. see your slides at the moment. Um, that can be correct because I don't have slides. Oh, I'm sorry about that. All right. No, no, it's okay. So uh, second uh, real, real thinking was when we were doing fundraising. It was really uh, when we dealt with individual investors to finance the loan book, we faced issues around collateral. So there were, um, there were investors that, uh, that, of course, wanted to see a collateralized loan. Uh, when investor two came in and investor three came in to finance the loan book, Investor one needed to give approval after that investor two needed to give approval for investor three and so on. So dealing with those intercreditor com uh, complexities was uh, was rather um, intense and it uh, and it caused delays in our fundraising. Further, uh, we also noticed that the disbursements and the repayments of the loans we were getting did not match the underlying cash flows of our of our loan book. So on the one hand, you could every now and then have uh, large cash surpluses in the business, while on the other hand, uh, you would have times where, where three, four installments were, were due at the same uh, point in time, which meant that all cash in the business needed to go to pay those installments, and uh, you, you could run into, into cash flow issues leading to stockouts. So uh, with that in mind, we started our first SPV last year in May, uh, but it was from that moment already very clear that one SPV and in particular one uh, one investor in the SPV uh, would not uh, be able to uh, to support the funding need of the of the loan book in in subsequent years 
So it was structured in the very beginning already as a multi-lender platform. Uh, so simply as, as loan amounts uh, would, would become too large for a single inf investor to, uh, to, to bear. So the idea of syndication was already uh, brought into the structure, although the first SPV that we, uh, we rolled out last year was only with SunFunder. Now what have we really uh, learned from that? I think uh, it, it's, it's basically for maybe five things. Uh, the first thing is it took us a year to get the structure up and running. And during that year, you have to realize you have the, bo the worst of both worlds. So basically, you still have to find uh, money from, uh, from lenders to, uh, to fuel the growth of your loan book, while at the other time, you, at the other uh, side, you, you're, you're structuring uh, the, 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 the SPV structure. Um, so it, it, took, it took quite long. I mean, right now, of course, with, with structures like us uh, around it, it, it's expected to take, uh, to take a shorter amount of time. Uh, second is um, is really that it uh, what we learned is that it it helped us tremendously to have a relationship of trust with SunFunder. So it was already we had already uh, we had already had at that time already like two or three loan cycles completed with SunFunder uh, before we started structuring the SPV. So there was already a relationship of trust, and also during the structuring, uh, it was very. Um, yeah, I think what contributed a lot to building mutual trust was that we continued to be extremely transparent about what was happening in the business uh, and in order to, to create a relationship of trust. So as I said, what, what helped tremendously as well is that we could test run the structure for, uh, for close to a full year before really uh, getting in new investors, which is something we're doing right now. So it helped us basically to uh, to take out the uh, the initial errors that were that were put in without having to ask approval for from a whole uh, group of investors. So I think that was really something we we benefited from uh, a lot. Now that we are um, that we are fundraising uh, in a syndicated uh, for for the syndication of our second SPV. I mean I think. Of course, it is a bit complex to manage the unique needs and expectations of, of various uh, investor groups in terms of terms, in terms of, uh, you know, and, and everyone needs to be on, on one level in order to participate. So in that sense, I think maybe underlying to, to this trend, I also see that the market is changing a bit from you know, a market where um, yeah, where lenders were were very dominant about loan setting loan terms, interest rates. I mean, the market starts to change a bit now that some some companies uh, like ourselves are getting close to profitability, and it becomes a bit easier to uh, to raise funding from the market. I think as a final uh, input at this stage, I would want to say that. Um, you know, as a CEO, it, it feels a bit strange to uh, to do this together with SunFunder. Although I know it's the best way to go, but it feels like in the fundraising, you become slightly also dependent on the arranger of the syndicate. David will explain that later on. Um, you know, but but as we are, it's not that that as a company you're doing the fundraising on your own. You really partner up with the arranger of the of the facility. And uh, you, know, you have to be ready to, uh, to put the trust and, and to, to give away, you know, to, to become basically partially dependent on the success of the fundraising from the arranger of, of the syndicate. And I think, um, you know, that is working out very well. Actually, I would even say this is working out to our benefit. So I think right now with SunFunder doing the joint fundraising, uh, as they have also been uh, a lender in the in the first SPV. Now that we are bringing in other investor groups, it 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 shows a lot of confidence, and um, you know it's a, it's a vote of confidence to new investors to uh, to do the f uh, fundraising jointly rather than than on our own, like like we've always been been doing. But I think it's it's a matter of you know, being becoming ready for it and and realizing that the benefits out out there are. Way higher than um, you know than than continuing to uh, to chase funders individually as a company and and being a bit opportunistic about it. I mean, having said that, I think it's good, uh, David. If if you continue, give a little bit of uh, 
you know, the theoretical background and, and for me to, to jump in later. Wonderful. Thanks very much, uh, Willem. And, uh, and, and thanks for that introduction. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm David Batley and, and it's great that we had mugshots uh, up uh, earlier, so hopefully uh, some of you will have, have recognised me. Um, as, as was said in the introduction, um, my background, I've, I've been five years, uh, a little over five years in the industry, but before that I was nearly a decade in, uh, in syndicated loans working in the City of London for primarily European uh, investment grade, but, but across a broader spectrum. So from my perspective, this is a very exciting moment where the sector is catching up to some industry knowledge that, uh, that I've had the, the fortune to be able to, uh, to, to bring and, and which hopefully will have relevance. Uh, so I'm just going to call this up and hopefully it will, it will work. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. You're good. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, um, Willem uh, covered very well some of the issues that uh, may well have resonated with some of the practitioners on the call, um, particularly around the issues relating to our, our flagship SAFI end customer receivable financing structure, um, which, as Willem said, we developed, you know, in collaboration with, with SolarNow. Um, but I, I wonder if it's worth just taking the step back, uh, first of all, just to really kind of make sure that we're 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 all starting from the same the same uh, basis of knowledge. Um, I guess the obligatory plug just to just to kick things off uh, about SunFunder itself. For those of you who don't uh, know us or maybe don't uh, yet know uh, as much as as is uh, shown here, we are a specialist debt provider to the solar sector. Um, I am conscious that on this practitioner network, it is broader than just solar. And the one thing I would say is that this solution is broader than just solar. Obviously, that is the focus uh, because that is SunFunder's focus uh, in, in, my, in my talk uh, that I'm about to give. But as I say, the solution is, is a generic one, and we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, so I guess a few key stats. We've unlocked over $40 million. Uh, we've completed over 90 transactions. In, this is all in the solar sector. And on normal range of loans, it's between, uh, I guess, around about $100,000 and $2.5 and million. So it's quite a broad range. And through that, we've had less than 1% default to date, which uh, you know, really does, does speak volumes about the, the credibility of the sector, despite its still relative youth. Um, and one thing that's not mentioned on here, um, but I did cover it a moment ago, is that we, SunFunder, can now do local currency thanks to an MFX agreement that related to our OPIC-backed Beyond the Grid Solar Fund, which is where all of our uh, primary financing is coming from in the deals that we're now structuring. So let's just uh, put the context uh, around here that uh, to date the sector has been equity led for its financing needs largely, especially the, the, the bigger, the biggest players. And that reflects the stage of maturity. Equity is obviously particularly good for um, Getting, uh, getting to a position of proving a business model. But right now, the sector itself is maturing. Many of the players have really started to get to that point where the business model is more or less proven. And scaling with debt is then the very logical consequence of taking those, those proven business models to the next level. And that means that you know, debt is an increasingly important part of, of where the sector is going to go. So why, why then is the sector ready for this? Um, the, the debt needs, in, in short, are growing faster than many, as far as I'm aware, all lenders' single customer concentration limits. It, here in SunFunder, we have, we have grown our ability to do large tickets dramatically. But even that, uh, and I, I will be corrected by my colleagues when I say we, we can do about three and a half million or so currently that is growing, but the, the, the needs of the sector are growing far faster than that. And with double digit deals, you know, being, being put on the table by a number of lenders now, a number of uh, practitioners now, it is clear that single, custom, single lender deals are only going to be part of the solution. And so that's the first bullet point, exceeding some lenders' cap 
capacity or appetite. But the second point is, is a bit more subtle. As we're trying to encourage more investors into the sector, um, there are many that are that are coming on stream, starting them off with a new ticket size of, you know, two million plus dollars equivalent can be a very difficult ask. Of course, you've got to balance that against many lenders' requirements for, for a return, which does require a, a decent ticket size. But nevertheless, that size itself can cause uh, challenges. So then we get on to the other part, and, and Bill covered this very well, but with more loans, with more lenders, treating them separately is, from a practitioner point of view, a nightmare. There is far more debt management complexity. Um, obviously, if there's security, it becomes even more so, that you've got intercreditor arrangement, potentially lots more management time. And if there's a debt that's not fully matching um, one part to another, you know, both in terms of covenants, structures, but even as I say security, that can dramatically reduce the company finance ability because effectively you're taking the worst of all, all worlds and often with cross defaults happening between your loans, you have to be very careful to make sure that obviously you're meeting each and every one of your, of your covenants. So that leads us on to syndicated loans. So just to, to really set the, the, the background of, of what a syndicated loan is, it is a loan from a group of lenders, that is the syndicate, for a single borrower. It is typically led by one uh, lender, although it can be multiple lenders for the very largest deals, who is the arranger. That arranger will pitch for the uh, initial transaction. They will negotiate with, with the borrower. And as Willem said, their credibility is absolutely key because it's credibility on two fronts. Credibility to actually structure the deal that's, that's appropriate for you at a price that is right for you, but it's also credibility with understanding the other lenders that are in the space and being able to put together a facility that is actually going to be attractive to others. So the arranger role is a very, very important one. And the arranger, as I said, establishes the basic terms and launches the transaction to the participants on behalf of the borrower. So having negotiated with the borrower to get the, the terms that you know both parties can be comfortable with, the arranger's role is to represent the the borrower themselves to the participant banks and to really justify to those other lenders where and why the structure is 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 appropriate and this is a very very well established uh, um, process in developed markets there are um, vast markets for this in particular syndicated loans are almost essential for any m a activity because it represents the only form of uh, secured funding that you can get prior to going public with a transaction and there, then you can do bond uh, issuances and so on. And there are very defined standards, so-called boilerplate templates, which have been developed over many, many years and continue to develop in in uh, in response to, you know, legal changes in, in, in various current countries and, and precedents that are set. And those are just, uh, defined by the... Um, I think it's the Loan Standards Trading Association and the Loan Market Association uh, for the US and the uh, European, Middle East and Africa markets respectively. So LMA is the one, if I'm honest, I'm most familiar with. It's typically English law based, but it can be, um, can be uh, translated into other laws. It's particularly useful within the African context um, because obviously a lot of the uh, African countries themselves start from, although obviously don't have any more, uh, an English law precedent uh, basis. And that then often means that the, the LMA um, language works very well. It obviously works in English law, but it can also translate and link very well to local law. So um, that's what a syndicated loan is. Um, what does it look like when we're doing uh, syndicated loans? Um, that's where the story gets a little bit more more tricky in the short term. There, there's no two ways about this. Um, the most, the, the, the majority of loans are right now hard currency and may well continue to be for a short term. Despite lenders like some funder now being able to do local currency loans, the lack of local banks participation in the sector does make local currency difficult. And even for those lenders who do do local currency, they're typically hedged transactions, which have a host of 
of, of little gotchas in terms of break costs and things like that that, that result from the uh, synthetic uh, translation from a hard currency, whether it be um, euros or US dollars, to a local currency. And of course, there's a limited number of investors. I I won't rattle them off now, but you can you can more or less count for the for the uh, for the for the solar space the the investors of of significant size and with significant exposure to the sector, more or less on one or two hands at most. And and and, and each of those lenders have very different approaches, um, both in terms of their documentation. But also uh, their just their approach. How long due diligence is required? What sort of things they're looking for? To what extent they're going into, for example, impact investment um, due diligence and, and you know, impact uh, data, and to what extent it's purely financial. And so there is no doubt that in the short term, a syndicated loan does not remove those barriers. It does not remove the immediately at least, the requirement for significant management involvement. And it is not a magic bullet for getting banks involved. However, in the medium term, it becomes a lot more interesting. And I'll come on to why this, uh, this is a, a, a very logical progression. It's also the progression that you know, the, the goal would be to aim for. Um, and, and, and of course, the goal is to aim for the ability immediately to have multi-currency deals for transactions that require US dollar basis, for example, inventory loans. Um, you can have that for those that are doing receivables and local um, currency becomes more appropriate. You can have those. In many ways, you can have them as part of the same deal. Uh, having a group of really established industry experts who are leading the deals and driving the due diligence process for other investors, this this is a very key point that herd mentality, uh, even amongst finance uh, uh, practitioners, does exist as a as a real thing. Um, banks and in, and indeed, you know, um, other other players do like to see that other investors are are looking at at, at uh, companies. It, it validates any internal uh, views that uh, that that the investment manager has has uh, has come to. And all of this, a syndicated process, does lead to a streamlined debt raising process. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll flesh that out a little bit more in a, in a moment. And it is my genuine belief that for all of the good work that's being done by many, many actors in the space to try and encourage local banks and indeed international banks to this, it is my belief that syndicated loans are the key that will actually unlock the majority of the capital. And I'll start with that point first to flesh out that if you are a, an investment manager working at a local bank or indeed an international bank that has an interest in this space and you are shown a syndicated deal, for a start it shows a level of maturity and a level of sophistication that those uh, banks will themselves appreciate. But it also gives you the option the first time, for example, to say no. Then you see a couple more and you may well still say no, or at least you're, maybe your credit committee will say no. But eventually, by being shown deal after deal, and you can then see directly that those uh, deals that you were offered, this is from a, from a bank perspective, those deals that you were offered are still working, the, you know, the businesses are still doing well, and all you did by rejecting the deal was turn away the interest income. That is, in my view, what will lead to the slow but steady um, normalization of the, the solar sector in particular with these banks, and that will break down their resistance. So jumping back then to flesh out this, the streamlining of the debt raising process with a single syndicated facility, or perhaps maybe two, probably no more than that. You don't want to have too many syndicates um, at once, but with one syndicated facility at a stroke, you can have all of your debt uh, requirements covered in a single facility. Now that may sound scary, and, and indeed with single lender um, debt, that is, that is a very scary concept, because of course if the lender changes their mind on, on you as a, as a business, then that puts you in a, in a lot, of, uh, lot of difficulty. However, with a syndicate, you've got a range of banks. If one of the lenders chooses not to 
renew their commitment to you, you know, in a, in a follow-on loan, then so be it. They fall out, another another lender joins. If the arranger, if the, if your lead bank decides that they, you know, this is quite unlikely, but if they if they decide that all of a sudden they don't like what they're seeing, well, there are, and again, going to bullet point number two, there will be a group of uh, lenders who will have that aspiration to be your arranger. Um, obviously, there's a there's a a small financial uh, incentive for doing so as well, but also there would be the the kudos. So having the the syndicate in place allows you the ability to create a a very stable group that even if one or two change periodically, you've still got one single system that um, that is basically um, able to 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 allow you to concentrate on running the business not on managing you know half a dozen debt facilities so what what are the bottlenecks that take us from this short term difficult but still you know there are advantages to doing so to the medium term you know i i, I won't use the word nirvana per se but you know the happier situation that would that it that it represents well, there are, there are four key ones, really. Um, investor education. For the vast majority, in, in my experience, uh, of, of, um, of investors, there is some knowledge in some places, but not a lot of knowledge. And um, some funder, we have actually taken it upon ourselves to speak to a lot of the major players. Um, again, I, 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 would, I would specifically name check uh, Oiko credit and responsibility um, but others as well and we've, we've explicitly spoken to them about their familiarity with LMA standard documentation and in all cases they have come back with a positive um, a positive view they their legal departments are aware of it it may not be their current house style but their legal departments are familiar with it they are comfortable with it and they do to um, have no problems that would require very bespoke versions of the LMA uh, documentation. Um, the second point is this uh, this this competitive slash collaborative relationship between investors. Moving to a state where, for example, some funder is offering uh, loans to, as I say, responsibility or equity credit, or vice versa, requires. A level of, of trust and sophistication which I believe the investors are getting you know we are collectively working harder to get ourselves comfortable with that concept and I think that's the right way to go of course there is still competition uh, and there should always be competition uh, if there were if it were a very cozy club that would not be not be good for the sector it would not be good for the practitioners it would ultimately actually not be good for the for the investors themselves um, and so the third point is, I mean, we've specifically mentioned DFI requirements, but actually, I guess it's 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 all requirements around security and seniority that a lot of the debt facilities in place at the moment are often, in many cases, secured, and they are often secured in some fairly uh, um, extensive ways. And so, moving from a position of having that security. Um, and of course, you know the, the the protection that it gives you to a, a more enlightened position where that security is perhaps shared amongst all of the investors, all on a, perhaps a peri pursue basis, does require a certain amount of give from the investor. Um, however, again, it is it is right for the borrower, and I know many many examples, and I'm sure listeners on the call will will uh, empathise with. Facilities which have been put in place, security has been granted, perhaps you know some sort of collateral, and uh, as the size of the, let's say it, it was inventory or whatever the asset has grown, the loan size hasn't, and in many cases that mismatch has caused huge problems down the line on how, you know, how subsequent facilities can be put in place. With uh, a syndicated loan, that doesn't necessarily preclude that happening. However, if it's a, a syndicated facility that's amongst a group of investors, then all of the investors are sharing equally in that in that security, and that means it can 
typically be, be allocated much more efficiently. And of course, the last bullet point is, I guess, really the point of this, this webinar, uh, educating borrowers on the value proposition that syndicated loans represent. The reason why it is and has been a very big staple in, um, in, this, in the developed, sophisticated markets. But also, it's not unknown even in, even in this market. I mean, you know, uh, the, uh, I don't know if the, the specific people are on the call, but, you know, the, many of, the, many of the, the very large receivable transactions that have been announced by the likes of MCOPA, Offgrid Electric, and others, uh, BBOX, are effectively syndications. They, ha they do involve multiple investors. And what, what we're really talking about is, is, is opening up this, this knowledge to the, to the masses and really trying to establish it as a, a core part of the financing solution that the solar sector has. And I think with that, I'm going to um, pass back, Jim, I think, to you uh, to perhaps open the floor for questions. David, David, thank you um, so much for that, and Willem as well for sharing both of your perspectives. And I will actually pass it to um, Sean to do a bit of Q&A with those of us who are online. But as moderator, I want to take liberty in trying to, uh, one, maybe summarize, as you kind of mentioned at the end, tail end of your presentation, kind of the benefits of syndication. I wanted to see if I could summarize the three or four points that I heard throughout both of your discussions and then maybe ask a couple of questions. Um, but starting with the benefits, the kind of the value proposition, I heard everything from um, syndication being really important in unlocking more debt transactions uh, as well as attracting more lenders to the space, uh, particularly uh, local lenders uh, becoming more important as, you, as one thinks about current EFX um, mitigation, uh, heard uh, a value or, or a benefit around the efficacy or the efficiency of transactions that syndication can uh, lead to, and then obviously uh, a benefit around risk mitigation, and I suppose that goes both ways, uh, both from the borrowers and the lenders. So, uh, if I've missed anything, certainly let me know. Um, but those are kind of the three or four kind of benefits that I had heard both both Willem and David talk about. Um, I just wanted to throw out a, a few questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw them out as a group, and then feel free to kind of answer um, what you can, and then we can go to Q&A. But one of the questions I had was, uh, and this is to you, David, are there any particular finance, financial institutions that some funder is seeking to attract and uh, get involved in your uh, syndications? That's one. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, the importance of local financial institutions and banks, uh, but I'm wondering if there are any other particular types of financial institutions. Um, a second question is, Willem talked a little bit about terms, as you did, uh, I'm wondering, are there any particular, you know, what structuring considerations does one need to um, really pay attention to to make a syndication work? Are there particular types of terms um, that are, um, yeah, more or less sensitive and ones that r tend to raise flags that both uh, that participants in a, in a syndication need to really pay attention to? And then... Thirdly, just a question, a clarification, if you will. You mentioned, you know, Parapasu. Um, if you could just provide a little bit of clarity around the differences between, uh, you know, a club deal, Parapasu, and, 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 you know, a syndication where you have tranches and, and senior and sub, subordinated debt, uh, maybe for those on the line that are not as familiar with those distinctions. So maybe I know sure. most of or for you, David, but feel free to, and Willem as well, address uh, whatever you can. No problem. I'll, I'll deal with the last one first, because in many ways that's that's the quickest quickest one to answer. The, the a club deal um, could be as simple as a, a series of uh, bilateral uh, loans that all happen to be done on the same basis at the same same time with uh, with a, a specific investor. At a slightly more complex level, it could actually be a, a, a syndication where all of the lenders have the same ticket size. Just, at, I guess, from a from a technicality point of view, 
So it, it could be exactly the same thing um, is one version of, of what people refer to as a club deal. Um, the, and actually, I guess just to expand on that, um, the, there was actually a club deal that uh, a club deal in the sense of multiple bilaterals, um, all on consistent uh, commercial terms, that Sunfunder uh, was involved in with a with a with a uh, borrower. Um, I won't name them, but uh, what, the one thing that I I, I would say is that um, both from an investor point of view and also particularly from a borrower point of view what should have been a very simple and straightforward process turned out to be less so because precisely because of the the bilateral nature of the trend of the each of the loans led to each of the investors um, trying to sort of effectively use their house style to change the look the feel in some cases the terms of the of the facility and actually it became quite quite a, a difficult um, a difficult process to, to close on time. Um, we are actually in discussion right now with that with that very uh, investor about having the next uh, iteration of that deal as a true syndication, uh, which we are hoping to to lead. Um, so on the on the, the structuring point, I'm sorry, I'm going in reverse order from your question. So your question was about uh, what uh, syndicated loans, you know, what kind of structuring cons uh, considerations would be of relevance. I guess from a from an LMA, that, that's the European um, uh, uh, structure uh, approach point of view. Um, the 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 LMA facility is in and of itself best thought of as a framework. Uh, it contains a lot of boilerplate um, clauses, particularly ones around uh, relating to kind of you know the U.S. Patriot Act and things like that, that require you know, basically all lenders will need. The commercial terms are overlaid on top of that. So um, there is very explicitly a document that you can download, which is a, a template, which is provided by this uh, NC LMA. Um, and it runs to, uh, this may come to one of the points we want to cover in a moment, it runs to over 100 pages. There's one version for a term loan, one version for a uh, revolving credit facility, uh, which uh, you know, I, I would say at the outset to any practitioners uh, listening and, and perhaps getting their their hopes up, some funder cannot do revolving credit facilities. Most most um, fund based investment investors cannot. It's really a bank thing to be able to provide that revolving uh, nature to to financing. Um, however, those templates exist uh, just as as uh, a a blank document full of square brackets. Over that, you you would you would uh, well, or your lawyer rather would put in the terms, the tenor, the the price, the you know the, any amortization. If you wanted it to have multiple tranches, perhaps with um, either different tenors, different um, interest rates, indeed potentially even different uh, levels of security, you can do all of that within the framework. So the framework in and of itself is is really just a, a it covers the so-called boilerplate stuff, the stuff that really should not be um, commercially sensitive. Sometimes, in some cases, they are. So, for example, um, almost all investors do need a certain amount of time to be uh, informed of a, of a drawdown on the facility. The the LMA just puts in a a you know a time frame for that. It is potentially subject to negotiation, but it's typically not uh, not particularly you know commercially sensitive um, which I guess also leads me on to uh, Jim I think the other point you were talking about you know the Perry pursue point uh, so so Perry pursue for anyone who's not uh, uh, as familiar with with legal documents literally uh, I, I'm not sure, sure what the Latin translation but I think it means literally the same um, the point of Perry pursue uh, lending is to say that you are on the same legal terms if, if an insolvency or you know, if a bankruptcy happened both investors would be queuing up at the same time in the same queue at the, in the same place they wouldn't be one in front of the other one would not get special treatment relative to the other and so if there's not enough uh, money available this is very much the lender's point of view you know disaster scenario for, for debt recovery 
there's not enough money to to uh, repay both investors, then both investors will uh, take a loss or an equal loss, a proportionally equal loss. Um, the final question I think you asked was around what have we done to work with local banks and to attract them. Um, very specifically, and uh, Bella mentioned the, the SAFI transaction that we are we're working on with uh, with him for the the second iteration of that of that deal. We are and have been talking to a number of players, uh, both banks themselves directly, uh, but also to uh, the Lions Head Group and the ALCB fund, which although that is a, a bond based. Um, investment tool it does lend itself quite well to taking a syndicated loan and effectively repackaging it so we're having those discussions i have to say they are still at a relatively early stage but again i, I reiterate the point I, I made in my presentation that i fully expect the first couple of syndicated loans that you know we put in front of of investors you know will just be will just be rejected by most investors maybe we'll get lucky maybe we won't but it's over time, seeing consistently those invitations to deals that continue to do well, that is what will turn the heads of, uh, you know, of, of um, investment managers and their bosses. So if they can, if the investment manager can, can, you know, point to half a dozen transactions that they have had rejected by their credit committees, which are still doing well, that is a much stronger internal case that they can bring than uh, a much more ad hoc discussion. Great. That's um, appreciate the clear-eyed view on that. I think, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand it over probably back to Sean to facilitate um, kind of Q and A with uh, with the audience. Sean. Great. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, David and Willem, for the presentations. Uh, we are receiving a good amount of questions, so I'll just jump right into them. Um, first one on the list is. Uh, asking if the speakers could say what they would like to see multilateral stakeholders such as the IFC, World Bank, African uh, Development Bank, do more or less of in the area of debt finance? That's a great uh, question. Um, happy. Fill in, please. Uh, I think um, if you if you talk about the, the structuring and and the syndication deals we we've, we're working on right now, it it uh, it means we're going out to the market with a with a predefined uh, package of terms and conditions. I think uh, looking at, at the way uh, many of the DFIs think, it's you know it's either their way or the highway. It, it, there is no way in between, or there's there's no way there can be so flexible. To subscribe for the terms and, and conditions of um, you know structures like this. On the other hand, they can be extremely helpful uh, by uh, by de-risking some of the structures, uh, which, as far as I know, but, but David, you you know probably more than I, hasn't happened yet. So by taking first uh, first loss investments in syndications, de-risking uh, de-risking other investors. But I mean, it's it's a bit early stage, and and I haven't seen uh, things like that happen. Yeah, thanks, Philip. And I, I I agree with both of those points you've 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 made. Uh, I think um, I think in my experience of seeing DFI investment in um, in in borrower positions in in borrowers that that Sun Funder has as as customers, we've we've often found it quite difficult, precisely because of the that uh, relative lack of flexibility that that Willem mentioned and it, it can often uh, translate to a effectively taking a, a such a super senior position that it actually makes it uh, you know incredibly difficult for a, a normal lender to actually find a, a, a risk profile that they can get comfortable with it, you know in in summary the the if if a uh, a DFI is offering, you know, fabulous interest rates. Of course, you know, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to take it? Well, the answer is if you can't get any more debt, and because, you know, because that DFI has taken all of the available security, then it's a, you know, it's it's a sugar today uh, situation. But tomorrow might not be quite so so helpful. So, from my perspective, to answer the question of what would I like to see 
you know the, these multilateral uh, players really really do I'd really like to to see them engaging with this process of how can they work with financiers not not uh, effectively try and supersede them um, which I'm, I'm sure is not the intention but that is that is often what what is uh, what is happening great thank you both uh, moving along to the next question uh, this attendee notes that the World Bank Group report on mobilizing Islamic finance for infrastructure in uh, private uh, public partnership projects in developed countries will be released in May. Have you any experience syndicated uh, with syndicated energy infrastructure financing from this source of capital? So uh, syndication is is in in the project finance world is is very very uh, common it's it's almost as common as, as in the uh, investment grade world it does require a slightly different um, investor outlook and in many ways some of the same issues that uh, if you like plague the the, the, the financing of, of these longer term infrastructure projects right now would continue to exist namely the the tenor the mismatch of tenor most of the impact investors uh, and the investors that are active in this in this space right now do not have a horizon that goes. I mean, even five years is relatively uncommon, and so that mismatch I think would remain. Um, the ability to to ultimately open out the field to a, a more diverse group of investors, which syndication may do in this in that case, um, would definitely be helpful. But it certainly wouldn't be a magic bullet for it. Thank you, David. And you just touched on this a little bit, um, but we've received this question from a couple of people. Uh, given the poverty of typical end users of off-grid electricity suppliers in rural Africa, what payback periods are being tolerated by investors? That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, uh, Willem uh, can, can talk to, to the solar now um, uh, approach, which, um, you know, spoiler alert, is two to three years. Um, I think, I think, generally speaking, um, most of the, the the practitioners tend to be moving towards that that shorter term uh, payback period, typically on a kind of more lease to own. There are there are exceptions to that, so that's certainly not a not a uh, you know a, a set in stone rule. Um, I think, from an investor's point of view, the the debt always has to match the underlying receivable. And indeed, the the way we've structured SAFI is precisely to do that. It's a it's a limited term um, uh, asset finance approach. So the the assets are brought on over a short period of time, and then they run off over the longer period of time. And that is the loan. It's not it's not trying to be a an evergreen. You're not you're not trying to constantly refinance the same assets. You're simply saying here's the here's the group of assets. We will wait as long as we need to before we get our money back and then we'll, we'll recycle that money in for the next loan. Um, that's that's the approach of, of SAFI and I think that's probably consistent with uh, certainly what I um, am seeing across the, the space of the investors. Does that answer the question fully? Yes, I believe it does. Maybe just, oh. uh, maybe oh. just to add for, for those, I mean, Take a country as Uganda, uh, the effective interest rate we are paying on Ugandan shillings loans is currently 23%. That means that, that you can, if you, uh, if you want to even break even on your pay plan, you have to charge at least around 40, 42 uh, to 45% effectively. So although I think most practitioners would, would love to give longer maturities, it actually doesn't make the product much more affordable to the end user uh, if you go from two years to three years. I think it's really a question of, you know, once we start seeing um, the uh, the interest rates decreasing and, and also we can start decreasing our, our effective interest rates to clients, it becomes much more uh, interesting to start playing with longer maturities, even up to five years. What we don't see is a correlation between maturity and default. So, for instance, a client that takes that takes a pay plan for two years is not more inclined to default than a client that takes a pay plan for only six months. So that that's, that can be said. So we would be very keen to uh, to increase, but 
uh, it's just uh, I think that really what limits us is, is the, uh, the the effective interest rates in, in countries like Uganda. Thank you, Willem, and thank you, David. Um, is it hard to come up with different loan products for syndication given the different risk appetites of lenders? That's a great question. Um, I think what we're seeing across a number of the the, the deals that we are either working alongside or with with customers who have multiple facilities with with other investors, we are seeing a, a, a fairly high degree of consistency. Um, I would say at the kind of impact investor um, level, I think banks are in a very different place right now, um, and I don't think we're trying to to move. Uh, towards where they are, are quite the opposite. Um, so I think with regard to is there any difficulty in structuring, um, the the honest answer is time will tell. Uh, as we see more and more of these deals, I think it will lead to uh, a level of understanding and uh, knowledge that will that will go both ways. Uh, so while we think, while we like to think we have a very solid understanding, both obviously of the market, but also of the other other players that are you know alongside us providing finance into the market, that knowledge will be refined over time. And as we as we work with with our customers uh, to syndicate transactions, we will over time discover there will be some surprises. Some some lenders will will suddenly turn out uh, that they can't do something specific. But if I'm honest, those um, possibilities are relatively limited because. In all honesty, the um, the types of transaction that we're talking about are relatively limited. Um, as I say, as I said at the outset, they're they're, they're all term loans. Uh, that's that's a, a, a limitation of the the funding sources that we have available to us. Um, and then beyond that, it's really just a question of where can people get comfortable from from you know, for example, an, an amortization point of view. What's their tenor horizon? You know, what 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 are the what are the sort of key interest rate uh, requirements that they have and I think those we we already feel we have a fairly good handle on by you know, just by precedent of what we've seen in other transactions. Great thanks David um, and so who who do the this is kind of a summary a couple summary questions here uh, on some topics you've touched on a little bit but who, who do the syndicates really typically consist of and what criteria must the borrower usually fulfill? And then also, what are the thresholds of the highest and lowest loans, typically? Uh, great question. Um, I, I can almost answer in, in two completely separate uh, forms of language. Uh, one, you know, one, one which is um, focusing on the, the, you know, the big wide world version of it, and syndications have um, I was actually, I, was, I have to confess, I was looking on Wikipedia to see what the largest syndicated loan ever done was and I can't honestly remember off the top of my head but the largest one I was personally involved in was um, 12 billion pounds there is there is very little practical limit uh, at the upper end um, condensing that down however to this space um, most of the lenders uh, have I would say ticket appetites up to at most at I mean, there are, there are really one or two honourable exceptions, and when you get to multilaterals, the, the, the rules of the game are slightly different. But at most, ticket sizes are really kind of in the three, four, five million mark. Um, you know, beyond that, you're, you're, you're really talking about rarefied uh, heights of very large investors. Um, so, so with regard to, to, uh, to the size, yeah, upper, upper limit is... is is really just a, uh, as, as much as anything it's a, it's a matter of how uh, how large a syndicate group you can put together um, and or what you can do to encourage again going back to the point of you know how can multinational players and, and those with very very large uh, pockets how can they work with us uh, in the space to to help make this a success that's that's the answer on the smallest size that's so that's again a very interesting question. Um, most lenders will typically, particularly for the more complicated transactions, for example, SAFI, for example, um, would require a minimum ticket size just simply to make the economics of income that's generated from the deal work out. If it's a more 
vanilla loan, if it's a simple inventory loan, um, there isn't, I, I don't think, quite so much of a pressing uh, requirement on that. That said, um, some funder does tend to find uh, the market for, for lenders offering loans to, to borrowers of ticket size less than 500,000 to be pretty sparse. And, uh, and in fact, you know, at the, at the smallest end of that, you know, up to 250, to $250,000, we, we tend to find it pretty much to ourselves. I apologize if any other lender is on the line and, uh, disagrees with that, but, but that's, that's our, our practical experience. Um, so I think, I think with regard to creating a syndicate, um, offering people ticket sizes that go below their single, um, their sort of single deal um, requirement from a from a, uh, a costing point of view clearly won't work either. So that does put a practical minimum on a syndicate. You know, a two a two bank syndicate would be, you know, therefore five hundred thousand smallest. Um, though you can also have differing ticket sizes. In fact, it, this is quite common that the arranger might take a larger ticket, or, or some investors might take larger tickets, and in return they get a slightly higher proportional fee as well. Um, sorry, I've been waffling slightly. I think I, I think I covered the question, but I may have missed part of it. Um, I, one other part was, who do these syndicates typically consist of? Who are the main lenders in the space? Ah, uh, right, yes, exactly. Um, so like I say, the, 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 I, I, I've been sort of deliberately uh, hesitating from name checking the, the lenders, uh, partly because if I forget any obvious ones, then they may not forgive me. Um, but you know the, the 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 names are all the same names that you you would be talking to about single um, single uh, uh, individual loans. So as I've mentioned Oiko Credit Responsibility already. I can mention Global Partnerships. I can mention um, Solar Mosaic. I think they changed their name. Apologies. Um, you know those sorts of of investors. You know PG Impact Deutsche Group or Deutsche Group Foundation. Uh, SEMA is coming online soon with the Global Capital you know, Climate Fund. Um, there are various others that are coming on stream soon. Like I say, I'm 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 trying very hard not to just name check as a as a list. But um, uh, I think with with all of those investors, you know, we we are speaking to almost all of them already, um, and they are showing interest in the concept of the syndicated loan. In addition to that, part of part of what makes this very exciting is that those are the kind of lenders that are actively structuring deals right now. They're going out to investors, uh, sorry, to borrowers and, you know, and trying to, to win deals. There are a, a large number of other players and quite, quite a few of them involve sort of microfinance um, focused groups who are now looking at the energy space uh, as well as, as well as, as others, including, you know, some of the family funds that want to, to access directly that don't really have the capacity or if I'm honest, the desire to to get down into the into the into the weeds of of structuring a transaction with a with a specific investor, but if a, if a deal was brought to them, then they would show interest. And we've had exactly that conversation with a number of our, our own investors who have expressed an interest in lending additionally directly into the space. So I think there is a very real chance of you know a syndication done correctly opening up the liquidity available to the sector. Thanks again, David. Um, we have a couple of questions on syndicated loans specifically for certain technologies. Um, one is asking uh, what you can say about uh, syndicated loans specifically for microgrid financing. What are the main difficulties um, and what would be the optimum way to structure that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, with with microgrids, um, we're really back to the same sort of challenge that I mentioned earlier with regard to project financing, which is that for many microgrid business models, the um, the repayment, uh, well, indeed the whole project time frame, is is not one that can be compressed within five years. Um, so I think I think that same problem exists that um, the syndication in and of itself doesn't solve the, the, the mismatch between investor uh, ability to lend and the, uh, 
you know, the business model itself having a requirement for cash flows generated over a, a longer period. So that's that's really the uh, that's really the core core challenge. And like I say, a syndication wouldn't wouldn't directly uh, you know change that actually in any way. Um, it might going back to my earlier point about opening up liquidity. It may be possible that it makes um, that it, that a structured transaction that uh, you know a, a, a solar specialist such as Sun Thunder um, had structured and brought then as a deal to some some other investors as say for example um, MFI investors who, who may well have the the funds and the capacity to do uh, longer term debt it may be that that opens up liquidity but there's I very I, I don't have any any evidence or you know one way or the other on that on that point thanks David um, can you talk a little bit about syndication arrangers um, do you have any insight on what the typical cost for that is yeah really great question um, you know for in, in, in the uh, in the world that I came from uh, you know where where transactions were um, not six or seven or eight figure they were typically nine or ten um, the the fees were, were always uh, in always in basis points um, I think that is I think we're still in the same sort of range I mean we're talking proportionally smaller institutions um, uh, if I were to put myself on the spot uh, for the purposes of the practitioners here um, put myself in a very uncomfortable position what we're really talking about is trying to to get cost recovery so depending on the amount of work that's required we're kind of talking oof, hmm, we're talking in the, in the ballpark of, of tens of thousands of dollars uh, of fees potentially um, it wouldn't be more than that and in many cases could be at the lower end of the tens but it depends how much work and, and, in, and these initial syndications there's no doubt they are and will be hard work um, so I don't. I, I hope that's sort of vague enough that nevertheless answers the question. Sean, this is this is Jem. Can I just jump in with a follow-on question? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, and this is something Willem brought up in the beginning around the amount of time it took to kind of set up the the initial structure. Um, curious, you know, as you talked about arranger fees and, and cost recovery maybe kind of using um, the market for, you know, syndicated loans in Europe and America and the U.S. and, and other um, markets as a guide. I mean, is, how, how long does it take typically to structure an initial syndication and, and how, how do you see that evolving in an emerging market in a sector like the off-grid energy access sector? I mean, Willem mentioned a year. I mean, what what can we expect in terms of the the time aspect of setting up these structures? Yeah, great question, um, Jem. So so uh, the the syndicated facility in and of itself adds practically no time. I mean, explicitly, some funder made a syndication ready, although it wasn't syndicated deal, just a, a straight vanilla loan, and I think the whole process took us uh, a month and a half from initial conversation to the borough to dispersing loans um, including all, all of the, the legal uh, documentation so syndication doesn't have to slow things down what what slowed things down and you know what was complex in the solar now transaction was we were we were literally creating a uh, an asset finance solution from scratch from first principles um, now that we've now that we've done that replicating it is is not without its work, um, but it is a significantly easier process. However, when you get to a syndication proper, you know, with with multiple investors, and you know, what's the time frame? The answer is it's as slow as the slowest investor that you need to have in the deal. <laughs> um, so, you know, in other words, if 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 one lender, you know, some funder turns the deal around in, you know, gets credit approval in a, in a month. Uh, and another investor is taking three months to do it. If you need that investor's money, then it takes three months, and that's that's the that's the challenge of it. The, with the advantage being that those lenders 
would be doing it simultaneously, you would have the ability to set timetables and say, look, if you haven't completed by this date, then, you know, the deal closes and, and if you're not in, you're not in. Uh, but of course, that's a situation you can only get to if you have the, uh, you know, if you have the liquidity available that you need. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jim. Good follow-up question. Um, I have another question here specific to mini grids. Um, what about the debt service coverage ratio requirements on mini grid companies, which are still not cash flow positive at corporate basis? I mean, this is getting into a very specialized area. Um, um, look, I mean, the, 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 the big challenge with, with any financing, this is, this is not a syndication specific question per se. Um, the, the, the general finance principles apply to any debt service cover ratio. So if you've got a, in this case, a you know, business plan that is, that, that's, that's not generating cash, then to be honest, at, at a minimum, lenders are going to want to see that they have the cash flow coming in to at least make, at the very least, make the next payment. Um, and even that is is really at the, uh, at the tenuous end of things. So, um, you know, it, it comes down to the unit economics have to have to pencil out. If the, if the business model doesn't show cash uh, generation on a unit basis, I mean, we're talking about obviously from a corporate level, and, and so you know the expansion of the business will will offset all of that stuff. But if you're, you know, if 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 the cash flow is not coming, then it's it's always going to be difficult to provide provide any finance. I mean, that's 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 a simple truism. Um, unless there's sufficient confidence that the business model had been developed and, and was generating cash at that unit level. Does that answer the question? Um, I think so, the attendee, if not, can always, uh, can always follow up through the question pane. Um, another question that um, might be a little more specific, um, but is it possible under the different syndicated loan standards to combine senior and junior loans, effectively creating a higher risk mezzanine layer? Yeah, and in fact, the, the so-called leveraged loan market does exactly that. Um, typically, leveraged loans follow this um, ABC loan structure where you've got senior, junior, and, and mezzanine in between with memory serves seven, eight, and nine year uh, uh, debt respectively. I'm I'm going to you know just before any any practitioners get excited about that those the investors that go for those sorts of facilities have obviously the ability to do seven eight nine year debt as far as I'm aware there are no leveraged loan um, investors showing any interest in this in this space but to the to the to the specific question of can a syndicated loan have have different structures uh, have different uh, levels of seniority different different tranches of, of debt, you know, with those different uh, security or, or what have you, yes, absolutely you can. It's, it's, uh, it's just a documentation point. And effectively, all of the intercreditor discussions are baked into the document, so it becomes a very um, simple and clean approach to it. Great. And uh, this goes back to a little bit to the first question that we asked, um, but what role could the Green Climate Fund play in supporting syndicated levying, uh, lending, such as providing TA um, or providing capital grants to finance, final beneficiaries or risk sharing with lead arrangers? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so what can, what can GCF provide? Um, obviously, liquidity, obviously. Um, obviously, the flexibility to be comfortable with, um, with with syndicated loans, you know, being part of the portfolio, in respect of of sort of you know things that go you know in parallel with the deal flow itself, TA is definitely helpful, and I would specifically focus uh, attention on on legal costs because even uh, there are there are various pro bono services available, but having uh, high quality legal advice is something that, that borrowers and indeed lenders, but we, we typically have our internal counsel uh, to help us as well, you know, will benefit from. Uh, it will create a scenario where the, where the, uh, the 
transaction quality is high, but it also avoids negotiation around points that really aren't, if you like, negotiated uh, in the sense that they they are completely standard and it is a requirement. And if, if the borrower understands that what they're asking is unreasonable compared with the, the universe of borrowing, that, that's definitely a helpful thing. So, so that technical assistance can be helpful. Um, again, I, I, I raise the point that these um, syndicate loan documents can be extraordinarily long. They're, they're, they're not that long to read when you're familiar with them, but if, you, if, you're look, if you're looking at it for the first time, you know, a 60 to 100 page document is, is, is not going not gonna to add to your weekend, um, even though the, the, the bits that matter can typically be condensed into the term sheet. Great, thanks. Um, and just a clarification question from earlier, um, the SPV or the syndicating platform, uh, do they offer receivables as a security to the lenders? I'm sorry, so I, I think the question is, is in this case specifically around um, the SAFI transaction? I think so. Yeah, it was, it was from earlier in the webinar. Yeah, so so the the, the security package in in Safi is that the uh, the SPV is the owner of the receivables, and so the the security package in and of itself is is a debenture over over all of those assets and a share pledge over the entire company that owns those assets. Um, that's you know all that as a as a lender we have to fall back to. Um, so it's it, it is effectively bankruptcy remote from the from the the top corporate or the operating company um, but the um, but yeah the ability in in some sort of insolvency situation to pick that up and own all of the assets underlying it is is key great but say so that's that's a specific SAFI question that you know that's I guess uh, it, it happens that SAFI is a syndicated deal it does not necessarily need to be part of a syndicated deal thank you um, and probably time for just one more question. Um, what, in in your opinion, from a strategic perspective, um, would do you see as the syndicate lenders do you foresee entering the off-grid solar market over the next two to five years as the industry grows? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think there there are a number of funds uh, that are coming on stream. I, I name checked some of them earlier. But I think I think the big point here is is getting local banks in or local slash international banks, and I think it's the the international banks that will come first. I mean, they will they will typically have the the, the greater levels of sophistication and uh, and familiarity with you know what a syndicated loan is. Many local banks know as well, but it's just a question of putting the the right uh, relationship manager in touch with the right um, structuring specialist internally. To make sure they're having those conversations, um, so I think I think it's that wave of banks that will really make the 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 big difference here. And as I said uh, in my presentation, I, I really do think that it, it is the uh, the drip drip of showing deals that can be shown to have been successful that will help turn the heads of those banks. Great, thank you. Um, and as we approach the end of our time here, um, I will wrap it up there. Um, I just want to thank David and William again for addressing all of those questions and also our attendees for, for submitting those thoughtful uh, inquiries to us. Um, really appreciate the discussion. Um, before I go on, just uh, if there's any closing remarks from either Willem or, or David. I guess the only thing that I would uh, I would naturally want to do is to to plug some funder and, and say you know we we you know we are a specialist debt provider for this space we do consider ourselves to have picked up a lot of a lot of knowledge on this on on the way uh, across all the pieces whether it be distributors manufacturers um, grid providers you know even in even larger CNI uh, projects and so if there are any practitioners on the on the line who who have an interesting proposition and want to get in touch, please, please do so. I think my my email was at the end of the uh, end of my slides. Great, definitely. Um, we can resend that out as well um, to make sure folks have that. 
Um, and just a reminder, if you are looking, uh, another way to get that email, we'll be posting the slides to the Clean Energy Solutions uh, training page, so you can um, track it down there, but we'll, we'll be sure to send it out as well. Um, actually, uh, Stephanie, as I'm, I'm wrapping up, um, if you could look that up and, and perhaps send it out through the, the question pane so everyone can have it or the chat pane. Um, and so with that, um, just on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would like to again thank all of the panelists. We very much appreciate your time and also our attendees. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us today for the webinar. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues in those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy expert uh, support through the Ask an Expert service and also uh, this webinar program. And I do invite you to check the Solutions Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as any previously held webinars. They're all free and publicly available on the site. Additionally, you will find information on other upcoming webinars and training events. And just a reminder, we're now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Uh, again, just allow about one week for today's audio recording to be posted. Um, and so finally, I would like to remind everyone to please take just a brief moment to complete the survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. As soon as we wrap up, it should uh, pop up on your screen. Uh, there's just a few questions there for you. And so with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar.